you that are listening are women. I know I've heard from some of you that you pass on an episode or two to your husband, but I have a feeling you might not pass this one on, but maybe actually it might be a good one to pass on so he can understand you a bit more. But our female bodies are amazing and God created them just so perfectly. But unfortunately, a lot of times in our culture, we don't understand our bodies as well as we really could and we should. And we also just get down and can just be disparaging, not understanding and feeling like everything is out of control. Today is going to be the day that you are going to start to take control back. This interview that I had with Leisha Drews was fantastic. And like you'll hear me say in the episode, I wish that I had this information years ago, but you are going to get to hear it today. So sit back. You might want to grab a pen and a piece of paper to take some notes. But I just know you are going to be blessed and it's information that is going to really change you a lot in some really great ways so that you can support your body well so that therefore you can continue to homeschool well. Because you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with homeschool? As homeschool moms, we are so much more than just the academics and the curriculum. There is a lot to it. And so today is going to give you some solid answers and a framework to continue to work from after this. So stay tuned, buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a good one. Welcome to Little by Little Homeschool Podcast, where you'll learn tips and strategies that will empower you to home educate your children. I'm Lee Nguyen, a homeschool mom of over 12 years, which includes two graduates. When I started homeschooling, I was pretty much on my own and was desperate for encouragement and help. My mission is to be a source of encouragement and help to you. Whether you are just beginning your homeschool journey or you're deep into the homeschool lifestyle, Little by Little Homeschool wants to help you stay the course because all the time you are investing into your children is completely worth it. If you're ready to take your homeschool to new levels, keep listening. Welcome to Little by Little Homeschool Podcast, Leisha. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and just have been loving listening to some of your recent episodes, especially kind of like circled back around to them. And I'm definitely in the stage of homeschooling where um, my oldest is in fourth grade. We're about to be fifth grade next year. And so I'm kind of like, okay, like I've been like going along with homeschooling. And then now I'm like, okay, it's starting to get a little more serious. I need a little bit of you know, some wisdom. So I've really been appreciating your podcast for that, but I'm Alicia Drews. I'm a registered nurse and I worked in the hospital for about 10 years before I transitioned into natural health, functional health, got a couple of certifications in functional health so that I could work with people who were struggling with health problems that they didn't need to be hospitalized for so that they wouldn't get to the point where they needed to be hospitalized. And then as I started doing that, I found that I really, really loved working with moms and women who were either trying to get pregnant in pregnancy, early postpartum, had had a couple of babies, like this stage of life that I have moved into as I've been doing this. And I have found that when we're able to understand our bodies better, it just makes a huge impact on who we are as mothers, on who we are as educators. So that is why I'm here and that is what I do. And I have three little kiddos of my own. They are nine, five, and two and a half. They're about to have birthdays. It's a super fun season and it's made way better when your hormones are not a mess. I can tell you that. Well, I'm excited that you're also a homeschool mom. So you can relate to those that are listening because you are there in the trenches and you're trying to maintain and balance your health and take care of the kids and everything that goes along with that. So can we start off with a super basic question? Because you and I were chatting before, and I think a lot of us didn't start with a lot of information when we were young. We weren't taught a lot of information. So can you give the names of the different phases phases of a woman's cycle and then a brief description of what occurs during each in relation to our physical and hormonal changes? Yes. Yes. This is a question I love because I think that we should have all learned this definitely in middle school and or for sure at our first OB doctor appointment, if not in middle school. And I can tell you, I didn't learn it there, kind of learned it in nursing school a little bit, but I couldn't have told you anything about it until I started really doing this on a daily basis. I'm just going to do a quick little disclaimer. I know everyone's cycle is not 28 days. That is okay. 
I think a normal cycle range that is healthy is going to be between 26 to 27 at the shortest to about 35 at the very longest. So if you're somewhere in that window, this is what I'm talking about. If you're shorter or longer, that could be a sign that there's something going on that, you know, you need some support with. So, but I'm going to talk about a 28 day cycle just because that's kind of like the standard and that's the easiest to talk about. So where we start in the cycle is day one is the first day you start bleeding. And day one, the first day of your period is going to be your menstrual phase. And the menstrual phase lasts either about seven days or the whole time you're bleeding. So that might be just a little shorter, a little longer, depending on your cycle. But the menstrual phase is where your uh, female sex hormones are at their lowest point. So your estrogen and your progesterone are both going to be at their lowest point at that phase of your cycle. And what that does in your body is it drop when those hormones drop, it makes you start bleeding. So that's the obvious, but it also creates a little bit more of a connection between the right and the left sides of your brain. So you have a little bit more ability to be analytical during that phase of your cycle, as well as a really great ability for planning in that phase of your cycle. And then physically, besides the bleeding, it's pretty typical to be a little bit lower energy as well as a little bit lower social energy. And when I talk about what's normal in a cycle, I'm talking about these like really gentle waves in your hormones where you see these kind of like gentle changes, not a huge roller coaster of like crazy high, crazy low, crazy high, crazy low throughout your cycle. So I would consider normal for your period to be moderate bleeding, not a lot of clotting, not a lot of pain, not really heavy periods where they're, you know, out of control. It changes the way you live your day because of it. And when I'm talking about having a little lower energy, a little lower social energy, to me, that looks like, Hey, I noticed I'm on my period. I might want to nap this afternoon, or I might need an extra adrenal cocktail. It's not, I'm on the couch for three days because I'm exhausted. I'm moody and I can't walk because my belly hurts so bad. That is not normal. So that's period phase. And then after period phase, we move into follicular phase, which is when your estrogen starts to rise. And when your estrogen starts to rise at this point in your cycle, it starts slow and then it goes pretty quick after that for a few days, goes up pretty quickly. And what that's doing is it's telling your ovaries to start maturing one of your eggs, or it's actually ends up maturing several eggs. And then one of them is ovulated. And it does that by increasing the size of the egg in the follicle, there's like a little capsule around the egg. And as your estrogen rises, it triggers a hormone called follicle stimulating hormone that makes that happen. And so estrogen rises, follicle stimulating hormone rises, and then you have kind of like a peak of estrogen the day before ovulation happens, usually somewhere around day 14 ish, if we're talking about a 28 day cycle. And when that happens, it triggers one more hormone called luteinizing hormone or LH. And that's what you can see on like an ovulation test strip if you're ever testing that. Um, and that hormone triggers the egg to actually be released. And so that's your luteinizing hormone. Ovulation occurs usually around day 14. And so the follicular phase is that whole phase where estrogen is rising. Those other hormones are being kicked into gear. And then it, it continues up to ovulation up until that egg is actually released is the follicular phase. And so during that follicular phase, estrogen is rising. A lot of times emotionally, it can be a phase where you're more like feeling more creative or you're feeling more social, more outgoing. A lot of women notice that libido can be higher in this phase because our bodies were created to be the, I mean, they're the most fertile. They're only fertile in this phase of your cycle, essentially. And that is the time that our bodies are going to be most interested in having a baby in reproduction. And there's studies that have been done that I think are so interesting that your pheromones, oxytocin, those things are higher at this phase of your cycle where you are more physically attractive, not only to your husband and not only to the opposite sex, but even to like other women around you, or even to your kids, your voice could be rated as more attractive. It's just like very, very interesting. We're magnetic at this phase of our cycle. And so what is normal in this phase is really to have better energy, a little more creativity, a little more social, maybe wanting to try something new and not a lot of symptoms, to be honest. Now, some women do have symptoms in this phase of the cycle, and that comes from estrogen being out of balance. It comes from gut issues. It comes from histamines. It comes from inflammation. Those are all other conversations. But if you have symptoms at this phase of your cycle that feel like you're going to get your period, then something's off with your hormones, and it is something to look into. So that's follicular phase. And then 
ovulation phase or kind of like it's post ovulation phase is just a couple of days after ovulation. So around like a three to four day window where ovulation occurs and then progesterone rises. And so this is my like coolest nerdy thing about hormones and the female body. But when ovulation occurs, that little follicle that was holding the egg is going to collapse and it becomes a temporary organ to sustain your progesterone levels, to create progesterone and to sustain that throughout the rest of your cycle. And if you get pregnant that cycle, that little teeny organ will make enough progesterone to keep your baby going and to keep you pregnant until your placenta takes over. So it's like incredibly smart little organ and stays just the right amount of days that you need it to and produces progesterone for the rest of your cycle. So we talked about estrogen rising in follicular phase. It rises to a peak and completely drops off. And then you ovulate, that LH causes you to ovulate. And then within about 24 hours, you're going to have a rise in progesterone. And that progesterone rise is what causes temperatures to rise in the body. If you are tracking basal body temperatures, if you're not, we have resources we can link you to on that because it's super helpful, super important. And you see your temperature rises, but with progesterone increasing, you typically will notice like kind of a sense of calm in the body Um, that is usually... It's kind of like instead of your energy being like go, go, go energy, it might still be like good, solid energy, but just like with a little dash of calm along with it. And your thyroid is going to be up leveled. You're going to have a higher metabolism function, and that's what causes your body temperature to rise. Now, with that being said, those few days after ovulation are a really good time in your cycle for communication, for getting tasks done. It's usually like a really kind of like calm and productive phase of your cycle. And again, it's really not typical to have symptoms in this part of your cycle. I wouldn't consider that to be normal. And I would consider those symptoms to be something to pay attention to and look into because your body, anytime you have symptoms, it's trying to tell you that something needs to be paid attention to essentially. So ovulation phase is just a short little phase. And then for the rest of your cycle, hopefully about 10 days more is the luteal phase. And the luteal phase is named after that little cute organ, the corpus luteum that is making your progesterone. And that's going to keep your progesterone high through the rest of your cycle. So the luteal phase is the phase that I see typically gets the worst rap. It's the time where it's like shark week, it's PMS, it's all the things that we find to be negative about being a woman. And most of those are not normal. Most of those are not something you need to settle for. They are common, but they're not normal. And so this luteal phase when progesterone is higher is a phase that should feel pretty good for the most part. Now, where we run into trouble is that a lot of times this estrogen that we've made in the first half of the cycle is not being moved out of the body very well or you're not making enough progesterone, so you've got an imbalance there, or you just are making so much estrogen that it's kind of like flooding over into the second half of the cycle and things are out of balance. And when things are out of balance, this is when we see symptoms like PMS, PMDD, and those can both be mostly mood-based, but also physical. So it could be anger, irritability, it could be anxiety, it could be depression, it can be any of those things to like from like a one to a 10 level. And when we get like in my opinion, like the seven, eight, nine, ten, that's PMDD versus PMS. But again, my expectation in a good normal cycle is that you're going to see little waves. So if you had a little wave of PMS that I would consider fairly normal, it would be like those last couple of days before your period. Maybe you just notice like, man, I'm just not feeling like quite like myself. Like maybe I'm a little, like a little bit snappy every once in a while, or I could just really use a nap or I'm really annoyed that I planned my kid's birthday party for this day. What was I thinking? Like that just like a little bit of irritability, but you're not like, you know, laying into your family. You're not a totally different person. Like that is pretty typical and normal. And not everyone has to even experience that. You can feel great your whole cycle, get your period and only know because you're bleeding. So I just want to say that we can go one to 10, but you don't even have to have any of those symptoms. Um, And then there's other PMS symptoms that can come up too that are like breast tenderness or hormonal acne prior to your period or cramping or bloating, Um, like bloating and gas and GI upset are really common before your period. But all of those things are your body telling you, hey, something's out of balance here. Pay attention. And unfortunately in our culture, we've just normalized it and it's just like, ha ha, mom's having a bad day again. Right. But if you're the mom, it's not really that funny. (laughs) So, um, anyway, so that's the luteal phase. 
there are a wide range of symptoms that can come up there. But in my opinion and my experience, none of those have to really be happening. And if you're struggling with those symptoms, they can get better. I feel so super clear on everything right now because right. like I was saying, like I didn't, my mom didn't tell me much about any of this stuff. I, it was just that time that I grew up, we just didn't really talk about that kind of stuff maybe. And I've just been trying to be really intentional with my daughter and finding resources. So that was it right there that we could be done. No, we're not gonna be done. <laughs> I've got more questions and stuff, but I love that you pointed out that just because something is common doesn't mean that it's normal and you don't have to stay stuck in that, which we'll get to, you know, all the resources and stuff that you offer. But a lot of women do feel stuck in a perpetual cycle of not feeling their best. And we all want to feel amazing, especially as homeschool moms. We have a lot that we're doing. Can hormones really be the root cause of many of the symptoms that we're experiencing? Okay. So this is a question that gets me on some rabbit trail. So I'm going to try to stay like <laughs> relatively in the same space as we are. So yes is going to be my first answer. Yes hormones can be a cause of a lot of symptoms that we experience as moms. So the, all of the symptoms that I just talked about, like period symptoms and mood symptoms around your cycle. Absolutely. Yes. Those can be hormone based. Other symptoms that I see blamed on hormones that can be related to hormones are going to be like not having good energy, weight gain, not being able to lose weight. Those are really big ones. Those are, I think those are some of the most common ones that we also see blamed on hormones. And I think that we have to expand the conversation a little bit and say, okay, first of all, can these things just be caused by estrogen and progesterone? Some of them can be weight gain, especially, you know, that's a big concern for a lot of moms is something that can be related to estrogen dominance because estrogen dominance can cause you to hold on to weight. And then when you hold on to weight, those fat cells actually make more estrogen and you kind of like have this cycle. And there's a lot of other hormones that are at play as well. These are not the only hormones we have. We have tons of hormones in the body. So then we have to bring stress hormones into the conversation. So stress hormones are cortisol, DHEA. Cortisol is something that we absolutely 100% need. It gives us energy. It helps us survive. It helps us go into fight or flight when we need to. But unfortunately, most of us are in fight or flight a lot of the time because we're keeping up with the house. We're keeping up with the kids. We're trying to like do all the things. And our brains are telling us, this is an emergency. This is another emergency. This is another emergency. And when our brains are telling us that everything is an emergency, our brains are really, really good at doing what we say. And when our, we're telling our brains everything is an emergency, our brain says, this is an emergency. I believe you. I'm going to tell your adrenal glands to spit out more cortisol. And when we get in that pattern long-term where we're just pumping out the cortisol all the time, that can cause weight gain. That can cause exhaustion for sure, because over time, your brain starts to question, hold on, is this like, can we still really be in emergency mode six months later, two years later? Can everything be an emergency? And then we start to have dysfunction between the pituitary gland in the brain and the adrenal glands where they say like, let's try to slow down some of this cortisol production. Sometimes we get into like burnout a little bit where our adrenal glands, like it's not like they've shut off or anything like that, but they're not producing as much cortisol or we've got like a big spike at night and then we can't sleep. We're tired, but we're wired. There's a lot that goes on there. And so absolutely that can affect energy that can affect weight gain. And the big kicker is when we're in that stress mode, when we're in survival mode all the time, we're not going to make our hormones the right way because your body is 0% going to prioritize having a baby, which is what it considers the priority with your hormones. When you're like over here, like, look, there's a bear, there's a fire, there's a tiger all day long. That is just not how your body works. Your body is there to protect you. It's not protecting you if it lets you have a baby in the middle of a fire and a bear attack, right? And so there's just like, some connections that we have to make. So yes, absolutely. Most of the symptoms that we experience as women can be based on hormones, but it's not always just estrogen and progesterone. It can be stress hormones. It can be thyroid hormones. It can be insulin, which is also a hormone for blood sugar balance. So there's a really, it's a really big picture. And I actually don't consider hormones to be the root cause of mostly anything because the root cause of hormone imbalance is all of these other stress triggers, whether that's toxins, gut health, like there's just so much. So Hopefully I kept that like semi in the same arena. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, my next question maybe is kind of a little bit silly then. This, you know, how do we know if our hormones are imbalanced? Because it's, it's even more than that. Is that is that a good place? So maybe the telltale signs is where we start with and then go back to hormones and then go back to the root cause of that. Is that 
Is that the mm-hmm. good way of doing it? Yeah. So I have really good news. I know I just said like a million things could be wrong with you, but the beauty is there's only really a few simple things that we have to do to start the cascade of all of those going in the right direction. So yes, your stress hormones might be a problem. Yes, your gut might be a problem. Yes, the toxins in your environment might be a problem. Yes, you just feeling like everything's on fire is going to be a problem, but there's a lot that we can do to create safety in the body. And when we start to create that safety, again, your brain is really good at doing what it tells you to do. And if you're like, hey, brain, I'm safe. Hey, brain, I'm safe. Hey, brain, I'm safe. Your brain is going to start being like, oh, good. We're finally safe. I'm going to work on your gut. I'm going to work on your hormones. I'm going to start not killing your adrenals by asking them for all this cortisol. And then we start to move in the right direction. So the telltale signs of hormone imbalance are kind of a lot of the things that I've said, like having bad periods, having low energy, maybe struggling with weight gain or not being able to lose weight like after kids, not feeling like yourself, having mood swings, like all of these things are telltale signs, but it may not just be a sign that you just need to take like a supplement for hormones because there's probably a lot more to the picture. This is such great information because everything is interconnected and everything within our bodies are interconnected. And we've often been just kind of made to feel like there's just this, there's just your brain and there's just your arms and then your legs and then your heart and your lungs, but it's all so interrelated that plays into another and that our body is sending signals and telling us things and we shouldn't ignore them or mask those and try to figure it gets to the root cause. So when our hormones are balanced, we've done done the things and, and we're feeling like our hormones are balanced. How does our capacity for increase? Like how, how, how does, how does that feel? Does that feel good? And, and what does that look like? Yeah. So I think that I've kind of like painted this picture because I've absolutely been there and sometimes I'm still there and have to rein myself in. So I'm just really super being honest here. But when we're in that phase of like, everything's on fire, everything is a fire. I can't calm down, honestly. Like I'm just running around all the time. We get there with multiple kiddos. Like it just happens. And then you're trying to keep them home with you all the time. And you're trying to like teach them all the things that they might possibly need to know in their life. And then like, that's a lot of pressure, right? And then maybe you have like one or two things that you're trying to do for yourself, or you are involved in your church, or you have a business or a husband, like who knows? We're drowning at that point, right? So I think that really it's just going to be these simple shifts that we make where we stop feeling so overwhelmed by all of these things because our bodies are getting those signals of safety. And so what that feels like is being able to say, first of all, can I just settle down enough to assess what I'm doing here and see what's most important, right? And when we're, again, like we're going to talk about nourishment in a minute, but that's my biggest step is when your body is nourished, this is what it looks like. You wake up in the morning, you eat something that's good for you. We'll go into that in a minute, but eat something that's good for you. You don't have to just like wake up feeling anxious right away. You wake up with energy and then you start doing the things you need to do. And then you don't have a morning crash. You're not looking for coffee everywhere. You don't get upset the first time you try to put on clothes because nothing fits. Like there's all of these triggers that are just hormone related. I'm talking about ovulation phase. I'm not even talking about PMS phase, right? And then you like do school with your kids and then it's time for lunch and you're clear on what you need to eat. You're clear on what to feed your kids. It's reasonable to do. It's not going to be like from a box necessarily, but like it's going to be reasonable. And then you go throughout your afternoon without having an energy crash in the afternoon. You're not anxious. You're not moody. You're not drowning in your own emotions when you have more capacity. And that really just truly comes from those signals of safety that your body can get on the regular so that you can stay in this kind of like calm place. Really, I think that it's cutting through the overwhelm is one huge piece of it. And not to say that you couldn't overwhelm yourself again and pile too much on your plate, but I really do think that the more we start to nourish and start to create that safety, the more other things fall into place where we at least can make reasonable decisions without just being like, everything's too hard, I'm just drowning, and like two weeks out of the month, right? I think you're giving a lot of hope to the moms that are listening and I can hear myself and I wish, I wish we could like jump into a time machine and you could talk to me like 20, 15, 20 years ago because it would have been The problem is I didn't know any of this then. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. We'll take you as you are and then I go back in time and you teach me. But I think that so much of that is relatable, like the crashes, especially in the afternoon. And so there is 
a way of getting to the other side. And you spoke a little bit about nutrition. So what are some simple nutrition strategies that moms can use to improve their energy and their periods and the PMS and all that goes along with that? Yeah. So I'm going to just kind of share with you what my method is overall, and then I'll give just like a couple of quick tips as well. But what I have found in the last several years of working with women on hormones is that there are kind of like three main reasons that your hormones would be imbalanced. Number one is going to be too much stress in the body. Now, that doesn't mean you have to get rid of all your kids and all of your obligations to balance your hormones. I have all my kids still, and I'm still homeschooling them. I'm still doing all the things. But when your body is in that constant stress mode, it's just going to be a cascade for hormone imbalance. So stress is one big thing. And then that leads to either making too many or making too much of some of your hormones or not making enough. So not being able to make them appropriately, which means you don't have the ingredients to make them appropriately. So that's where nutrition comes in as well as really just making sure that your, your lifestyle is reasonable enough that you're getting those signals of safety. And then the other main step that we look at is making sure your body can detoxify those hormones well, because if you've got a clog in the drain, nothing's coming out and you're going to have problems, right? And so there's multiple layers of that, but they it can all be really simple. And so what I start with is we start with assessing nutrition and what I see most often. So some of you listening are going to be like, okay, that was me. Yep. This is me <laughs> is we get up in the morning. We start running around. We don't eat breakfast for a long time, or maybe we're intermittent fasting kind of just because we want to make ourselves feel like we're doing something good when really we're just not feeding ourselves. Intermittent fasting, I'll just real quick say, I know there's lots of studies that say that it's good for women who are in their childbearing years, who are stressed out. I don't ever really see that it's helpful. What I see is that nourishing your body is going to be most helpful. Loving your body is going to be most helpful and you're going to see really good results from that. So if you get up, run around for a while, maybe drink some coffee in the middle of that and don't really feed yourself well. And then maybe also kind of like eat the leftovers of the kid's lunch because you're running around still and you're busy. And then by the time you get to the afternoon, you're crashing, you're starving. You might eat a snack. You might not. And then dinner time, you'll eat a good dinner because you feed your family well. And then you're like eating some chocolate and maybe like something else and like something else at bedtime, right? Because you're actually starving. So what we're going to do instead is start off in the morning, 30 to 60 minutes of after waking up, eating something nutritious. It's going to be something with carbs and protein together. And it's going to just be something that you can get right then. It doesn't have to always be a full breakfast, but starting off with something in the tank before you have coffee is going to be huge. Even just that will change a lot. And then after that, learning to balance your blood sugar is really, really important. And I can give you a couple quick tips here. I also have a, just a brand new podcast mini course. So if you love listening to podcasts, obviously, because you're here, this is for you. I made it as easy as possible. You can just get this podcast mini course. It'll be in your podcast app. And I walk through exactly how to balance your blood sugar and a little bit more of the behind the scenes of why that's important for hormone balance. But that's truly like where I would always start with a busy mom whose hormones are out of place is you need to eat breakfast. You need to make sure it's balanced with carbs and protein. And then you need to be feeding yourself throughout the day to balance blood sugar. From there, the sky's the limit with how good you can feel, but that's always going to be a step that makes you feel better. I'm going to admit here that all of those things, I didn't start, but maybe two years ago. And the intermittent fasting, and I've spoken about that here. I might have talked about it. I did do an episode about um, just kind of getting a losing weight and getting back into shape and really discovering, you know, just eating better for my metabolism and, and actually feeding myself. And it probably took almost a year to actually be hungry in the morning after intermittent fasting for many, many, many years mm -hmm. and foregoing breakfast. And so now I get up and I'm like, within about 30 minutes, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm like hungry. I just eat something small. And then my family laughs because I eat second breakfast. And that is a big breakfast. I do that too. Yeah. Because I'm just not ready for like a big, and I make a breakfast sandwich. I make all that. I'm not ready for that first thing in the morning. And, mm -hmm. but yeah, but getting that, the carbs and the, and the protein and I right now, currently my daughter's not going to get home. So it's, it's myself and my husband and, and two teen boys. And they're like, are you trying to eat more protein than me? And I'm like, probably, but I probably, I don't know if I can. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah. Is and I, I feel so good. So to the moms who are listening, who are kind of doubting this, I know that I'm in a further season down the row with my body and my hormones and, and my age, but I wish that I had known these things, but like the picking of the food, you know, just kind of eating leftovers of lunch 
and yeah, just basically start. And then at night, everybody goes to bed and just eating whatever you can find, all the snacks and all the mm-hmm. things. Yeah. So yeah. And then you think you have a binge eating problem, but really you're just hungry. And it's just so like, even I'll just speak to cravings really quick. Cravings are a huge sign that your body needs something. Your body is talking to you all the time. And I'll, I think so much of the time we just try to be like, be quiet. Like I'll just take birth control for these hormone symptoms. I'll take ibuprofen for these headaches. I'll take coffee because I'm exhausted and I'll try to get myself mindset out of binge eating because I'm starving. But like your body is just talking to you. And when you listen, it's just, honestly, it's truly amazing how that works. That's true because there's times that I'm like, I'm kind of craving something salty and I'm like, okay, I, my body's actually craving something salty. So what's, what salty that I can put in that's not like Doritos or a bag of, you know, chips or something like that? Like what is, how can I, can I put a little more salt on my egg or something? And then I don't crave that mm-hmm. as much. So this has really been amazing information. So you mentioned on your podcast, so you have a podcast and all kinds of resources. So can you share where the homeschool mom is listening? Where can they go to learn more from you? Okay. So I do have a podcast. It's called happily hormonal because that is my goal for you is that you are happily hormonal. Your hormones are a gift from God and they are what allow you to create life. These beautiful babies that you have, and they truly are a gift and you can feel good even when you have hormones, I promise you. So come listen to my podcast, happily hormonal. I have a lot of episodes there for you. Start where you start at the beginning. If you want, I have, you know, start at the end if you want, it doesn't matter, but that's a great place to start. And then I do have the restored mini podcast course that I talked about. That's another really great place to start. If you're like, okay, I don't want to sort through podcast episodes. I want like the step-by-step to start. And then when you're ready for like the full system that will balance your hormones, I have just completely redone my program, Nourish Your Hormones. And that is going to walk you through all of the steps that I talked about, making sure your body can make the hormones well, can detox the hormones well, and that all of your lifestyle things are in order. And the feedback that I've been getting from my students recently is that it's finally making sense. They finally don't have to be overwhelmed and searching Instagram and the podcast apps all the time. And the steps are doable for busy moms. And I can attest to that myself because these are things that I do every day too. And I just want you to know, like, it doesn't have to be hard. It just doesn't have to. All of those resources are meant for the same thing to really help you understand your body better, love your body better, and show up in a way that is going to make you feel really good. Because I know if you're listening to this podcast and you care enough about your family and your legacy to be homeschooling, you want to feel good while you do it. You don't want to miss it because you're so grumpy. And so all of those resources are there for you. And I would love to email you, talk to you, see you inside Nourish Your Hormones, um, really have a big heart for women feeling good. Wonderful. I will put all those links in the show notes and I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful right now for the moms that are listening that are saying, yes, that's how I feel. And so you're telling me, Leisha, that I can feel better and I can not hit these slumps in the afternoon, not deal with the crazy fluctuations and everything like that. It doesn't have to be like that. So that's amazing. Thank you. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been great. I I could talk about hormones for days. So (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. That's why you have a podcast. I mean, I could listen to it for days too. It's been, it's such, and even it, like I mentioned, it just is not just for us. It's also so we can teach our daughters as well. And so Absolutely. they can, they can walk into their womanhood with all of this amazing information. So mm-hmm. thank you for yeah, being and, here today. Oh, I was just going to say really quick for those of you who do have teenage daughters, I keep my podcast. It's, it is going to be very informational. I am a nurse. I'm going to throw out the anatomically correct terms, but it's clean. Like you can let your daughters listen to it. It's not going to be anything that they shouldn't hear. Perfect. Because that sometimes is lacking. I'll be honest. It's sometimes with my daughter, I would have to filter out the information to give to her. And I love that everything you said, everything is just compact and there instead of trying to search here and there. Let's just, mamas, let's just go from like point A to Z. Let's just do it. And let's just do the steps and get to feeling better. So Thank you for all this. Thank you so much. Not only was that information so good and so important for you to hear, and like we were talking about at the end, it's so good for us to know so that we can share it with future generations. How neat was it to know that Leisha is also a homeschool mom? She is there doing what you are doing. She understands what it takes 
and the amount of effort and energy and everything that you are putting into raising your children and into homeschooling them. So like I mentioned at the end of the episode, all of the information so you can connect better with Leisha, hear more from her, learn more from her, possibly jump into her program even is going to be in the show notes. Thanks for listening to today's interview. And we'll be right back here on the podcast in just a couple more days. Thank you for listening, friend. I'd love to connect with you more. You can find social media links in the show notes and share this episode with a friend who could use a boost to her homeschool. See you back here real soon.